Welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad you can join us. My name is Kendra Julian, and I am the Adolescent Immunization Specialist for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. Just a few, a few pieces of information before we get started. The planners and speakers have nothing to disclose. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the Partnerships YouTube channel. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. Please write questions in the question box and the speaker will respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gara Summers. Dr. Summers is a nationally recognized expert on the etiology and treatment of cervical carcinoma. Over her 40 years in the field, she has published extensively on her research on gynecologic oncology. She's currently a gynecologic oncologist at St. Mary Hospital, Christ Hospital, and Holy Name Medical Center, as well as an attending surgeon in the divisions of gynecologic oncology at North Beth Road Center, John F. Kennedy Medical Center, and Pascack Valley Hackensack University Medical Center. So Dr. Summers, take it away. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, good morning to all, and uh, thank you, uh, for attending uh, this seminar. I, I hope uh, that uh, it will be very beneficial. Uh, Kendra, can you go to the first slide, please? Let's keep going. Thank you. So cervical carcinoma uh, is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. A great majority of the practice that I'm in takes care of women uh, that are very adversely affected by uh, this disease entity. When we look at the most common cancers affecting women worldwide, as you would guess, uh, breast is the most common, followed by lung and colorectal. And then cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women uh, around the world globally. Next slide, Kendra. So again, worldwide, uh, it's the fourth most common cancer. The greater majority of cases are, do occur in developing countries, the African continent, uh, India, uh, other parts of Asia. Uh, in our country, the five-year cause-specific survival is only about 69 to 70%. And as you might expect, the survival rate is much worse in a metastatic, recurrent, or persistent disease setting. Next size, slide, Kendra, please. So again, about half a million new cases every year, about a quarter of a million deaths every year. And in women, it's the second leading cause of cancer death in the world. Next slide. So if we look at uh, the patient populations in our country, most commonly, uh, African American, Latina, and American Indians are adversely affected more than Caucasians. In addition, these patient groups also have the lowest survival rates. Next slide. 
So again, as you all probably know, colorectal disease can be effectively screened as a precancerous lesion, as can cervical disease. Early detection is critical because approximately 40% of newly diagnosed cervical cancers occur in women with no prior screening. Another 10% of newly diagnosed cervical cancers occur in women who have not had any screening within the past five years. Next slide, Kendra. So we, in order to improve upon our detection, uh, there's been a, a push over the last 15, 20 years uh, to improve upon our pap smear testing. And the prevalence, uh, if you would, is equal between minority populations and white women in our country. Next slide, Kendra. The overwhelming risk factor for this carcinoma is one's sexual activity and sexual history. Women are much more prone to develop cervical cancer if they begin their sexual activity at a young age, if they have multiple sexual partners, if they have a history of sexually transmitted diseases, if uh, they also uh, have a history, if there's a history of immunosuppression, such as HIV-related diseases, patients uh, who are transplant recipients, immunosuppression is another risk factor, as it is for so many cancers. Cervical cancer is exceedingly rare in women who have a, a very low level of sexual activity or who are virginal. Uh, in the course of my clinical career, I have maybe cared for uh, two or three nuns who have developed cervical cancer. So exceedingly rare. Next slide. The, one of the greatest causes of this disease entity is human papilloma virus infection. Approximately 85 to 90 percent of all cervical cancer cases are linked to HPV. There are approximately 250 different viral types of HPV, but for the most part, 13 types in particular cause cervical cancer. Next slide. So again, HPV infections account for about 85% and up of all cervical cancer cases that we see. HPV infection is the most commonly sexually transmitted disease in the States. And believe it or not, 80% or more of all of us are exposed to HPV during our lifetime. Next slide. Surrogate risk factors, low socioeconomic status, a history uh, of being in a lower, socio lower income group. Again, uh, HPV and smoking has been shown to be a cofactor for the development of cervical cancer. Next slide. So how do we go about screening? cervical cytology, pap smears. Pap smears are incredibly beneficial. They're very easy to perform. The sensitivity is quite high and there's a tremendous ability to detect not only invasive cancers, but pre-invasive disease as well. Next slide. So screening recommendations, something that I'm often asked about, depending upon which society you may subscribe to, they're all a little different. I tend to like the American Cancer Society recommendations. 
And basically, if somebody is younger than 21 years of age, there is no need for a pap test. Women in their second decade like to recommend pap cytology every three years. Women in their third decade and up to age 65, pap smears and HPV co-testing every five years. Women who are 65 and older can exit the screening process if there is no prior history of pre-invasive gynecologic disease or invasive disease. Next slide. Again, uh, for women who are 30 years of age or older, HPV co-testing is quite important because as uh, you might think, uh, if the co-testing picks up uh, viral types that are linked with cervical cancer, it helps us triage patients who have pre-invasive changes. And again, as you might think, the combination of cytology and HPV testing is superior to cytology alone for detecting severe pre-invasive disease or carcinoma. Next slide. So before I discuss disease prevention, uh, if I had had an opportunity, I would have slipped this in. But in uh, the latest uh, monthly journal of gynecologic oncology, there was a fascinating article looking at screening in our country and looking at Caucasian versus African-American women. And what it was very interesting, what the authors found was that African-American women have a higher rate of screening pap smears. However, a lower rate of follow-up and a lower rate of HPV knowledge. So, uh, I think this is something that needs to be worked on and is a critical piece of information. So when we speak about knowledge of human papillomavirus, uh, thankfully we have an HPV vaccine which has been on the market uh, since 2006, which basically prevents uh, all HPV related disease processes. And again, uh, we're discussing cervical cancer today, but there are uh, many, several other HPV-related carcinomas, such as oral pharyngeal cancers, penile cancers, anal cancers, and vulva and vaginal cancers, in addition to cervix. Again, this vaccine is nearly 100% effective it is cancer prevention. Uh, the safety data are very reassuring over uh, many, many years, the time span, and over 200,000 vaccinations. Typically, what we see at most is pain and redness at the vaccination site. Rarely dizziness, uh, rarely nausea, headache. Uh, it, it is incredibly safe to offer this uh, to your patient population. Next slide, please. So again, dosing. Uh, first dose at a given date. Uh, second dose typically in a three dose uh, vaccination protocol, one to two months after the first dose. And the third dose, six months after the first dose. Next slide. So what age do we recommend starting the vaccination process? We target both boys and girls because boys can get oropharyngeal, anal cancers, penile cancers, transmit HPV, so we can't forget them. And typically, we recommend starting the process at age 11 or 12. However, 
it is FDA approved to be started as early as age nine. Several years ago, uh, it was recognized that if the vaccination process was started before age 15, a two-dose schedule uh, is sufficient. And you might ask why? Well, the younger we are, the more robust our immune response. So in younger folk, uh, it just takes that much less than uh, older individuals. Uh, and again, it's also been FDA approved uh, up through age 45. Although the efficacy as one gets older is simply not as high as in our younger patient population. Next slide. So, uh, you know, uh, as we all know with the COVID vaccine, storage uh, has been a huge issue uh, with, with certain of the pharmaceutical types. But with the HPV Gardasil vaccine, it really is not uh, a big to do. It stays in the refrigerator. It shouldn't be frozen. It's put in a dark corner, if you would. And uh, no fuss, as I say, and no muss. Next slide, please. So what is HPV? It's a virus without an envelope, uh, and it contains double-stranded, closed, if you would, circular DNA. The virus replicates in the cutaneous and mucosal epithelium of the female and male anal genital and oral pharyngeal tracts. And again, a minimum of 80% of individuals uh, in our country are exposed to HPV during their lifetime. And again, it's the most common sexually transmitted disease that we see in this country. Next slide, please. So again, a little bit more about statistics. Uh, and as I always say, when I'm discussing uh, vaccination with my patients, I simply say HPV vaccination is simply cancer prevention. Approximately 14 million people in our country will become infected with HPV every year. And every year, roughly 26 to 30,000 cancers are attributable to HPV. Approximately double the number in women than men. And again, cervical cancer is the most common HPV-associated cancer in women, with oral pharyngeal disease being the most common cancer in men. Next slide. Unfortunately, our state has one of the lowest vaccination rates in our nation. While about 60% of girls have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine, our rate is only uh, a little under 50%. And our vaccination rate for boys is significantly lower. There are only five states in the country with lower vaccination rates. Tennessee, Mississippi, Alaska, Missouri and Kansas. So please remember, one woman globally dies from cervical cancer every two minutes. Next slide. Before I go on to clinically invasive disease, a question that I'm commonly asked is, why is our vaccination rate so low? Our vaccination rate tends to be low because there, unfortunately, is still a lack of physician knowledge that is imparted to our patients. There is hesitancy on the part of patients because of this lack of knowledge. There are safety concerns 
from uh, the caregivers, if you would, of our, our, our younger patients who would care to vaccinate, there uh, has not been a robust marketing plan from the pharmaceutical company uh, who, who produces the vaccine. And uh, in some instances, although much less so today, uh, cost has, has been a, a big factor, but much less so today. I think it's readily available. So now, if I could, uh, let me go on to uh, the presentation of clinically invasive cervical carcinoma. So in our office, the typical symptoms and complaints, the patient will typically complain of an abnormal vaginal discharge. They may have bleeding after intercourse. They may uh, describe bleeding that is simply not related to their menses. They may complain about local pelvic pain or back pain. Uh, they may also complain about a change in their urinary habits or bowel habits. Next slide. What do we tend to see when we put in a gynecologic speculum? Well, there'll typically be an abnormal contour to the cervix. The tumor typically is necrotic. It can be friable. Uh, there can be significant bleeding. It can be quite malodorous. If we look at the vaginal tube itself, there can be disease which we see or feel onto the vaginal walls. And when we do a rectal vaginal exam, which is something we always must do as gynecologists, we can tend to feel disease out to the parametria, which is the connective tissue of the uterus and cervix, the side wall, the sacral uterine ligaments, which suspend the uterus posteriorly, so the nodularity and such uh, uh, is a key to letting us know, unfortunately, that there's extension. Next slide, please. So the only way to make a diagnosis is by a biopsy. Even if we get a pap smear, which shows us malignant cells, that's not good enough to offer a treatment program. So we must have tissue and we must have enough tissue uh, from non, if you would, necrotic areas of the tumor. So we tend to like to biopsy on the margin of the disease process than in the center because typically uh, central disease tends to offer up a lot more necrotic tissue and that unfortunately will not yield a definitive uh, biopsy report for us. Next slide. Well, gynecologic cancers are staged in different ways. Uh, cervical cancer is staged uh, in a purely clinical manner. One must do a pelvic exam with rectovaginal palpation to provide the basis for staging. And what I almost always prefer to do is uh, take the patient to the operating room and perform my examination under anesthesia because I can see so much better and my exam itself tends to be better, as you might suspect, because the patient is maximally relaxed. Typically, when this examination under anesthesia is being done, I try to invite my radiation oncology colleagues because oftentimes uh, they are involved in the treatment program of the patient, and it's great for them uh, to appreciate the disease before the treatment program 
is recommended. Next slide, please. So not too much uh, on pathology. There are uh, many different uh, pathologic types, but squamous cell is the most common cervical carcinoma histologic type that we see. Uh, with adenocarcinomas, glandular cancers coming in second. The incidence of adenocarcinomas is somewhat on the rise. We don't honestly know why, but uh, it is uh, more prevalent uh, than it has been in past decades. Next slide. Well, how might one determine how a patient uh, is going to do? Uh, what, what can we tell a patient about her five-year survival statistics? As you might expect, gross disease um, has a worse uh, prognosis than microscopic disease. Uh, the depth of tumor invasion, the greater the depth, uh, the lower the survival is. If the tumor invades into blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, then the survival figures go down. If there's local spread of the disease out into the parametrial tissue along the ligaments that suspend the uterus and cervix, these are also factors which would decrease the patient's survival figures. Next slide, please. So what do we do uh, in terms of working up our patients before we offer any treatment? Well, we tend to get certain serum chemistries. We wanna know what <clears throat> their blood count is. We wanna know what their renal function is. So, you know, we need to get a, a BUN creatinine. We wanna check their electrolytes, their liver function tests. Uh, Obviously, we, we would like to get a urinalysis. We always do a pregnancy test uh, in, in any and all patients who are of an age where they, where they could uh, be pregnant. And when the history dictates, we also do HIV screening because cervical carcinoma, unfortunately, uh, can be quite prevalent in uh, women who will have HIV related diseases, again, speaking to the immunosuppressed state. Next slide, please. Typical imaging studies that one may order, a chest X-ray, a CAT scan with contrast, an MRI with contrast, and a PET scan with contrast. Depending upon, and it's unfortunate, but it, it really depends upon a patient's insurance profile, uh, certain imaging studies we simply cannot get. Uh, the MRI tends to give us more pelvic detail than a typical CAT scan would, and a whole body PET scan will give us whole body detail and imaging with particular sensitivity and specificity to lymph node metastases. But again, uh, this, uh, the imaging tends to be dictated by the patient's insurance profile. So uh, we do what we can uh, with, what, with, what we, with what we're given, so to speak. Next slide. So once we're done examining doing our serum chemistries in our imaging, uh, we can then determine how best to treat the patient. And when we look at treatment of cervical cancer, basically it's broken down into a surgical disposition, 
a chemo irradiation disposition or uh, purely uh, chemotherapy and perhaps immunomodulating agents. As you might expect, in early stage disease, there are a variety of surgical techniques that one can do depending on how early the disease is and the various prognostic factors. Next slide, please. Many of our patients are of an age when fertility can be an issue. In very early stage cervical cancer, a procedure called a comb biopsy can be curative. This is a very limited procedure in which a cone-shaped piece of cervix is removed with ample margins. And when I say ample, we need to make sure that there is no disease at the margin sites. And a cone can be done. Uh, and at the time of a cone, we tend to put in uh, a uh, cerclage to, to, if you would, uh, when the patient gets pregnant uh, so that they can maintain the pregnancy to term. Another procedure which we've done, and we've done this successfully robotically, uh, is what is called a trachelectomy. In the trachelectomy, we remove the entire cervix, maintain the body of the uterus, and also remove the upper portion of the vagina. And this would be uh, done in a case of, again, stage one disease, but somewhat further along than what one would do for a cone. And interestingly enough, after this radical procedure, if you would, the pregnancy rate is quite high and the ability to carry uh, into third trimester is greater than 60%, which I think uh, is quite good. Next slide, please. So in women who are not interested in fertility, there are different types of hysterectomy, which we offer, again, depending on the clinical stage of the disease. Uh, we can offer these different types of hysterectomies depending upon uh, how locally uh, the disease is in terms of infiltrating the cervix itself. And when we speak about extrafascial hysterectomy, modified radical hysterectomy, and radical hysterectomy, we speak about removing the uterus. We don't speak about removing uh, the patient's ovaries or fallopian tube because that really has nothing to do, if you would, uh, with this surgery, and there is no benefit in terms of cure in cervical cancer by doing so. And again, uh, in women who are not menopausal, if we were to do so, uh, we would put them into a surgical menopause, which we try not to do. The difference between the various types of hysterectomy from extrafascial up to radical we tend to think of certain anatomic landmarks. The uterine artery, which is a major blood supply to the cervix. The ureter, which again, as we all know, uh, are the tubes that run into the pelvis that drain the kidneys. The sacro-uterine ligaments, which are the posterior attachments. And the vaginal tube. So when we perform an extrafascial hysterectomy, we are ligating the uterine artery, uh, simply uh, taking it at its offshoot of cervical branches. When we are doing a full-blown radical hysterectomy, 
we are ligating the uterine artery at its origin. And its origin comes off of the internal iliac or hypogastric artery. When uh, we look at uh, an extrafascial hysterectomy and uh, the ureters, which run in the pelvis, we are identifying the ureters in an extrafascial hysterectomy and dissecting them inferior to the specimen. But when we're doing a radical hysterectomy, we literally dissect the ureters all the way from the pelvic rim down into the bat bladder base because again uh, in a radical hysterectomy we are we are taking uh, much more connective tissue we are uh, taking at least half of the sacral uterine ligaments which we don't typically do in a modified or extrafascial hysterectomy so maybe that was more information than you need to know uh, but I just wanted to put it in there so uh, the lingo uh, doesn't uh, knock you off your feet. Next slide, please. Another uh, bit of surgical uh, intel. Uh, over the last 10, 12 years, we've started doing what we call sentinel lymph node mapping. Uh, one of the most common ways that cervical cancer spreads is through the pelvic lymphatics. And it's very important to determine whether or not there is lymphatic spread of disease. If there is lymphatic spread of disease, surgery is not an option. Uh, and one of the ways uh, that we can figure out uh, in 2021 whether or not there is disease uh, in the nodes at the time of surgery is by injecting a uh, radioisotope dye, most commonly a green dye called endocyanine green. Uh, it's given at the start of the procedure. If you think of the cervix as a clock, if you would, we give it at the three and nine o'clock positions. And then uh, with a laparoscopic camera or robotic camera, 10 to 20 minutes after dye injection, uh, we're able to hit a switch on the camera, which will show us uh, the green dye lighting up. We can dissect out these lymph nodes, get an immediate diagnosis. And again, if they are positive for malignant disease, abort the surgical procedure and proceed with another treatment. Next slide, please. So how do we treat disease beyond stage one? State disease that is locally advanced, if you would, uh, in the pelvis and disease that spreads <laughs> beyond the pelvis. Typically in disease, <coughs> excuse me, that is limited uh, to the pelvic region, uh, we treat with a combination of radiation and low dose cisplatin. When I say low dose, the cisplatin is given as a radio sensitizer not as a standard dose that one would use for chemotherapy. In the late 1990s, through very large studies, it was shown that by doing this, the survival rate markedly improved if you looked at the arm that had radiation in combination with weekly cisplatin, and it's given weekly at 40 milligrams per meter square, versus radiation alone. So this has become our standard go-to uh, with locally advanced cervical cancer. The patient, typically the radiation course is uh, given over roughly uh, 60 days. The cisplatin is given along with the radiation and it was determined that doing it once a week 
for the first six weeks of the radiation treatment program uh, was most efficacious. In patients uh, with metastatic disease, as you might think, there is a very limited role for radiation. And again, uh, cisplatin has been found to be the most active chemotherapeutic agent uh, in cervical cancer. And it's been found that adding a taxane along with Avastin or Bevacizumab um, is the most efficacious chemotherapeutic upfront regimen for advanced disease. Within the last several years, in patients who have failed, progressed, recurred, a immunomodulator named Keytruda, which acts at the PDL1 site, has been approved by the FDA uh, and gives, uh, if you would, a 15% response rate uh, in a very poor prognostic patient population. So this is our basic armamentarium, if you would, for locally advanced and advanced carcinoma. Next slide, please. Again, it is not uncommon to, see, to diagnose a pregnant woman with cervical cancer. And the uh, factors that go into whether or not a patient can maintain a pregnancy are obviously the stage of disease, the size, the lymph node status, the gestational age, and obviously the patient's desire to maintain that pregnancy. Next slide. Cervical cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer we see in pregnancy. And any lesion that we see during pregnancy must be biopsied. The good news is most of cervical cancer in pregnancy is at stage one. Next slide. So again, uh, the factors that come into our decision uh, making are the stage, the size of the tumor, the lymph node status, the, the age of the fetus. Uh, when we think of surgical options, we kind of break things down by gestational age of less than 20 weeks versus greater than 20 weeks. Next slide. When we find cervical cancer at less than 20 weeks, we recommend that management be immediate. Uh, and unfortunately, this does result in fetal loss. Uh, but uh, in disease that we find after 20 weeks, we've successfully delayed intervention from anywhere from three to 12 weeks with early stage disease. And any of the hysterectomies combined with a cesarean section can be safely performed after 20 weeks gestation once one documents, do, documents a fetal lung maturity. Next slide. When we look at chemotherapeutic options, chemotherapy can be safely delivered without untoward effects from approximately the second trimester on, if need be. Next slide. And again, any of the hysterectomies that I previously described can all be combined with a cesarean section. As you might expect, the blood loss would be significantly higher than in a non-pregnant patient, but it's all very doable. Next slide. I'm not going to speak too much about radiation therapy, but just to let you know, in cervical carcinoma, most typically 
radiation therapy is delivered externally and internally. And by internally, uh, we mean brachytherapy. And brachytherapy consists of afterloading devices, which are placed locally in the operating room by the GYN oncologist applied directly to the cervix and stabilized uh, with suture and packing. And we say after loading because after the procedure is done, the patients go down to the radiation oncology suite where the active isotopes are after loaded into the system. External beam therapy in 2021 is basically planned, uh, typically intensity modulated. And by that, uh, the planning is typically done with MRIs, with multiple views. And the advantage of doing this is to increase the dose one can deliver safely to the target tumor and organ and to spare the surrounding organs from morbidity. Next slide. So I tried uh, to have uh, one or several patients come on this talk and speak about their experiences. They were a little uh, adverse uh, to doing so. I have to tell you over the last uh, 24, 36 months. Unfortunately, I've been dealing a lot more with patients with locally advanced disease than with early stage operable disease. But the two patients that I've most recently treated, LC, a woman in her late 50s uh, who has a fairly if you would, demanding physical job. Uh, we've treated her with irradiation and weekly cisplatinum, had extreme malaise at the start of therapy, uh, but was able to maintain her job throughout treatment. And approximately eight to 12 months after completion of therapy, is, is now reporting that she's about 80 to 90% back to normal. Uh, IR, uh, a patient of mine who we recently diagnosed who is, is actively on treatment now, who unfortunately ha has locally advanced disease, and again is on radiation with weekly cisplatin. Uh, her biggest complaint is some minimal nausea which were able to uh, manage quite nicely with oral antiemetics. She has an 18 month old at home and she reports to me that uh, she's, you know, been able to keep up quite nicely with her toddler. So, uh, you know, this is my most recent experience with patients with this uh, disease process. So I think, Kendra, that's maybe our last, I think I'm back. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Summers. Let me finish. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Summers, um, for a wonderful presentation. Um, so now let's take a look at the questions from the uh, audience. Um, the question box is still open, so please feel free to continue to submit your questions if you have any. So now we can take it away. Thank you, Kendra. Um, thank you, Dr. Summers. Uh, uh, please feel free to uh, write the questions here. And meanwhile, we do have a few questions. So the first question is, if a woman is pregnant and has HPV, can she pass it along to her baby during pregnancy? Yes, she can. Okay. And uh, 
the, the question continued and it would, would uh, what would be the complications for that? Uh, you know, there, there can be some oral pharyngeal uh, papillomatosis, but typically uh, you, you tend not to. Uh, my maternal field uh, colleagues say that uh, it's, it's quite rare uh, to have significant clinical symptomatology. Okay, um, the next question is, uh, you mentioned that HPV vaccines should be uh, given up to the age of 45. What uh, circumstances this uh, be con contra contradicted? Uh, the only contraindication, quite honestly, would be an allergy to any of the vaccine products. Uh, there, if you've got a yeast allergy, I mean an aluminum allergy, uh, but, but to me, again, uh, it's so critical to get this vaccine. You know, obviously we stress the importance of giving it at a very young age and hopefully before the patients become sexually active because then we simply, uh, we're preventing any and all HPV related illnesses, but uh, it, it is efficacious in an older patient population as well. And it's been shown even with HPV related illnesses that the virulence and or if you would, recurrence rates of HPV related Ill of illnesses is decreased. We have another question uh, regarding pregnancy. If a woman is pregnant and has not yet received the HPV vaccine, could she be vaccinated during pregnancy? Um, you know, we don't vaccinate during pregnancy, but we do, you know, in the postpartum period. I, I don't know uh, what the FDA, I don't think the FDA has a Approved uh, the uh, Gardasil not uh, for pregnant women, not to my knowledge. And again, uh, you know, I didn't really speak of the history. Uh, when the vaccine first came out, uh, it, it offered protection against two viral types. And then as the years have gone on, uh, it offered protection against four. Since 2016, we've been uh, using Gardasil 9 as our vaccination uh, uh, vehicle in this country. And this offers protection against the nine most common viral types which cause cervical, oral pharyngeal, penile, anal, uh, and the vulvovaginal cancer. So Gardasil 9 is what we uh, give in this country today. Okay, thank you. So um, there's another question. Uh, what strategies do you suggest to decrease HPV vaccine hesitancy and increase the uptake? I think uh, there's unfortunately a fair amount of what I call medical mistrust. Uh, and we see this uh, more in our lower income patient population than not in our African American population than not. Uh, and one of the things that we've been so fortunate to do uh, is joining up with the partnership uh, to do outreach into these communities. You know, we all know knowledge is power. So the more you know about something uh, and simply uh, the more willing you might be uh, to uh, take on uh, the vaccination process. Whenever I speak to my patients, be it a grandmother, a mother, uh, uh, you know, a Gen X, Y, Z, 
you know, I always say, uh, this is cancer prevention, period. Uh, this can be 100% prevented. Uh, so I think knowledge is key. I mean, I think, you know, finances are not an issue anymore. Uh, the vaccine is readily distributed in the community clinics. I think, you know, the fact that in the younger patient groups, it's a two vaccine process versus three, you know, makes it somewhat less of a hassle. But I think you have to spread the knowledge uh, and you have to be committed to that. And the other thing I always tell everyone is that, you know, I have two teenagers now and when they were 11, they got the Gardasil uh, vaccine. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend something to anyone else uh, <laughs> unless, <laughs> you know, I, I, I had experience with it with my own kids. So knowledge, 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 knowledge. Thank you. Uh, we have one another question related to vaccination rates. So uh, the question goes, why do you think uh, New Jersey's vaccination rates are some of the lowest in the country? That's a great question because, you know, on the East Coast, you know, we think, we tend to think we're hot stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> not when it comes to this. Uh, I, I really don't know. Uh, I think we have large urban areas uh, where there's great hesitancy. Uh, I think we also uh, have uh, a lot of rural communities uh, where, uh, again, the knowledge hasn't penetrated. Uh, but it, it's quite sad. Uh, you know, it's quite sad. You know, this can be done. Uh, it's, it's, it shouldn't be such a hardship to get it done. But my guesses are uh, some large urban uh, areas, uh, you know, with lower income uh, and uh, less of a knowledge base, I think. Sorry, I was on the... So this question is, what are the barriers that women of color face? I am. Um, I know my cl uh, clients have completed gynecological visit and pap smears were done. One client has insurance problem to receive approval after abnormal pap smear. That was you know, the question. It's a thing uh, today, and that in many ways we're handcuffed by the insurance company. Uh, as to what we can offer. Uh, and I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I suspect if I did, uh, I would have uh, tried to assume a political career other than a medical career. Uh, but again, in reading this most recent article in my journal, uh, I was quite surprised that African-American women were being screened at a higher rate than Caucasian women, yet the follow-up and the HPV knowledge base wasn't nearly as high. And I think, sad to say, it comes down to the almighty dollar. Uh, but again, uh, I, at Newark Beth, we have a very robust oncology clinic where we take care of everyone and anyone. And, you know, we have a very robust gynecologic clinic, obstetrical clinic. I don't know what is offered uh, at other uh, hospital systems that uh, tend to serve uh, a lower income patient base. But, you know, I think within our, our community, uh, we've done pretty well. But it's a sadness. The other question is, what are some of the most common questions that patients ask after diagnosis? How long am I gonna live? <laughs> how bad is it? Uh, how far advanced is the disease? And you know, what are my treatment options? Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Mm. I guess, yeah, we still have another question. 
Yeah, this is a similar question. How does New Jersey compare to other states in cervical cancer rates? I think uh, that's a great question. And patients tend to do better throughout the country if they're being treated at centers that are have dedicated high volume oncology services. So the more you see, the more you get to do, and the better you will get at doing it. So in high volume centers, patients will do better. Uh, in, in a center that may not even have a GYN oncologist or the ability to refer out, unfortunately not as well. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, how can someone diagnosed with high-risk HPV do to prevent the cervical cancer? Well, and another great question. Uh, more intense screening program. You know, someone like this, uh, we might tend to offer something. I didn't mention this during the talk, but we have a machine called a colposcope. It's like a fancy microscope and we're able to magnify the cervix uh, 10 to 15 times to see changes which we might need to biopsy. And the other thing we tend to do if a person has high risk HPV on a pap is to screen them at more frequent intervals because cervical cancer should be 100% preventable, even with pre-invasive disease. There's no excuse uh, for a pre-invasive leak to an invasive leak. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Anal. I know we are pressed for time and we want to respect everyone's time. Um, Dr. Summers, thank you so much for you know providing such great feedback and a wonderful presentation. Um, but before we, we go, we close up, um, I just want to uh, introduce Anal. Anal is Anal Patel is the program coordinator for the public health programs for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. Um, she provides a presentation um, on the importance of HPV and the vaccine um, to dental um, offices and professionals and um, the community. So thank you, Anal, for um, taking you. care of the questions for us. Um, but for one last thing before we wrap up, um, I also want to thank Monica Smith, who um, is handling the technical back end of the program um, and all, to all of those who joined us today. Um, just a reminder, in about an hour, we will, we will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Um, your feedback is important, um, so please take the time to complete. Um, certificate, certificates of completion will be sent via email um, you provide on the evaluation, so please check to make sure it's correct um, and should be received within one week. Um, a calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at www.partnershipmch.org under the professional education tab. Um, we also offer on-demand recordings of many of our programs which are listed there as well. Um, and I hope you can join us at our next educational event. So thank you everyone who um, joined, joined us today. Thank you again to the speakers.